This session will inform our community about historic and current efforts to address the social, cultural, philosophical, ethical, and other conceptual issues in the field of astrobiology. We have three pairs of speakers, each pair featuring a natural scientist and a humanistic scholar. Each pair will engage in a 10-minute dialogue about a question or topic they've chosen, and plenty of time will be allotted afterwards for dialogue amongst the speakers and with all of you. Lucas is going to moderate discussion, and he's also going to come up here after I'm finished and introduce our speakers. And we encourage you to continue the dialogue throughout the rest of the conference. So I'm going to talk just a little bit about historical efforts to address social and conceptual issues in astrobiology and also current initi initiatives supported by the NASA program. To date, efforts to address what, what has been called so far societal impacts of astrobiology have been sparse, sporadic, and disconnected. These efforts have been initiated largely by natural scientists, and the records of these efforts show that they have been largely constrained by the scientific worldview, what I would call scientific thinking. They've also been largely Western-centric, and I would even argue US-centric, and much of the effort has been SETI-centric. But astrobiology today is a global endeavor focused on the search for evidence of past or present microbial life in the solar system and the possibility of life in exoplanet systems. And discussion of the issues at hand today uh, needs to broaden and focus accordingly. And in my work, I like to think about astrobiology and culture. What does astrobiology do and mean in the context of culture? What does it do or mean for people in different cultures, people of different worldviews? The earliest record I found of a NASA activity that pulled together a multidisciplinary group of scholars to address the social, philosophic, and humanistic impact of the discovery of extraterrestrial life is a report called Life Beyond Earth and the Mind of Man, and it's a transcript of a NASA-sponsored symposium that was held in Boston in 1972 to address the question, how might human beings react to the discovery of life beyond Earth? And the participants in this symposium were Ashley Montague, an anthropologist, Philip Morrison, the physicist, Carl Sagan, Krista Stendhal, a theologian, and George Wall, the biologist. Then we fast forward all the way up to the late 1990s when the astrobiology program really began to expand, and the community as well. The NASA astrobiology program um, toward the late 1990s, early 2000s, um, got involved with the American Association for the Advancement of Sciences Dialogue on Science, Ethics, and Religion, and co-sponsored a series of workshops organized by Doser on the philosophical, ethical, and theological implications of astrobiology. And those workshops were held in 2003, 2004, and a report was published. In 1999, a workshop on the societal implications of astrobiology was held at the NASA Ames Research Center. I don't think headquarters was involved in that. And that workshop was organized to address implications of astrobiology for human psychology, society, and culture, and the contributions that the social sciences can make to the field. And there is a report available on that workshop. In 2009, the SETI Institute in California held a workshop to develop a roadmap of societal issues relating to astrobiology. Participants in the workshop, which included myself, agreed that the product of the workshop would not be a roadmap for the astrobiology program or community, but a roadmap of issues for interested members of the social sciences and humanities. Uh, a paper was published in Astrobiology with this roadmap, and that workshop was funded by the, the NASA Astrobiology Institute, not the headquarters program. The NASA astrobiology community published its first science roadmap in 1998, and we had updated roadmaps in 2003 and 2008. And then in 2015, we have the next iteration, the NASA astrobiology strategy, which does not identify specific goals, objections, and questions relating to social and cultural issues, but it does include really a very interesting appendix written by Lucas Mix and Connie Bertka, who's not here with us today, um, and some of the topics that they raise as, as issues that we might want to think about and work on is the role of epistemolo epistemology in astrobiology. What are the comparative standards of evidence in astrobiology-related fields? Is the definition of life necessary to the pursuit of astrobiology? So that's kind of an example. And that strategy is available online, so you can read the whole appendix, which I would recommend if you're interested in this subject. 
Coincident with the development of this strategy, NASA Astrobiology, led at this point by Mary Wojtek, who's with us today, uh, initiated a number of activities intended to broaden and diver diversify the community of scholars participating in the ongoing dialogue uh, and to refocus this dialogue on the possible cultural impacts of the discovery of extraterrestrial microbial life. The scope of NASA's activities is specified by law, the NASA Act of 58, and these activities do not include an ongoing program of research into these kinds of issues. However, the law does include language allowing NASA to study the effects or implications of the work that it does. So astrobiology funding for recent activities uh, is intended as seed funding to provide opportunities for broader participation by scholars from multiple disciplines. The three activities um, that are, have been ongoing over the past three to five years, and some of them are wrapping up because, again, this was a short-term project except for one, are the Blumberg NASA Library of Congress Chair in Astrobiology, and we actually have two chairs here today. Uh, and a past and the current chair, and the Center of Theological Inquiry 2015-17 Study and Residence Project, an inquiry on the societal implications of astrobiology, and the 2015-2016 NASA Astro Astrobiology Debates Project. And again, if you um, are interested in more information on those activities, see my blog post. The Blumberg chair was conceived by Barry Blumberg and named after him. Uh, and it was created to support scholars interested in the intersection of the sciences and humanities. And the, the work that these chairs have done is absolutely fascinating. There have been a lot of uh, public uh, programs, uh, as well as private activities and a lot of private study. Uh, David Grinspoon was the first Blumberg chair. Steve Dick came next. Then uh, a historian named Nathaniel Comfort, and then Luis Campos, who's with us today. And I say, it's time for a woman's perspective. Let the next chair be a woman but uh, I have no inside information on whether that will happen. <laughs> and in 2014-2015, uh, instead of appointing a chair, the Blumberg Chair uh, Group decided to sponsor a series of interdisciplinary dialogues on astrobiology, and they were on uh, astrobiology and the religious imagination, rethinking life on Earth beyond, the role of paradigm shifts in science and human self-understanding, and historical, cultural, and artistic perspectives on astrobiology. And I was very lucky to be able to participate in all those dialogues. Met Kelly Smith, who was a participant in one of the dialogues. Uh, many, many interesting ideas and perspectives. So that was really a, a wonderful project. And there is some record in terms of webcasts of the public programs from those dialogues. Uh, one thing I observed as a social scientist during those dialogues were that the natural scientists who are participating tended to be quite optimistic about the human future on Earth and in space, while the humanistic scholars were virtually all pessimistic. Uh, so that's, you know, we have different worldviews. Um, as to the Center of Theological Inquiry project, we have a, a, at least a few participants. Pastor Lucas uh, was a, a participant, a fellow, you call yourselves fellows, right? Last year, and Eric Person is probably here. He's a participant this year, and if I've forgotten anybody else. Uh, oh, and Frank Rosenzweig, that's right, uh, is participating this year as well. And questions guiding that inquiry uh, or along the lines, if there are many different forms of life, known and unknown to us, what does it mean to be alive? Now, we've, we've heard a lot about <laughs> that question in some form or other uh, over the past three days. I'm not going to read all the questions for the sake of time. Uh, you can find them all online. The debates project was really terrific. It was very well organized and involved um, university and secondary education students. And it, it was an opportunity for them to hone their debate skills as well as learn about the science of astrobiology. And the organizers of the debates project pulled in a lot of experts, both from the natural sciences and from philosophy and ethics. Uh, it was very, very interesting. I was lucky enough to participate as a judge uh, in, um, in the final competition. Michael Meyer was a judge as well. I know Michael Meyer's here somewhere. Um, and so we'll be around later if you have any questions about any of these activities. And I'm going to turn it over to Lucas to introduce our dialoguers. Thank you for coming. As you, uh, as you all know, some of the most uh, exciting conversations happen over beer at astrobiology conferences. And uh, one of the challenges was to get some of the really 
interesting aspects of that conversation tied together with some of the humanities research uh, and some of the fabulous speakers uh, who have come to join us. So I would like to introduce for our first pair, we have Luis Campos, who is an associate professor of history at the University of New Mexico. He is the, a senior fellow at the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation Center for Health Policy. His PhD is in history of science from Harvard, which is where I met him. Uh, he works on the intersection of genetics and society and recently published a fascinating book called Radium and the Secret of Life, which looks at the beginnings of modern synthetic biology. Uh, he is the fourth and current Bloomberg Chair of Astrobiology at the Library of Congress. Uh, and he will be talking with Sarah Walker, uh, whom all of you probably already know, but I will say she is the Assistant Professor of Earth and Space Exploration at Arizona State University and Deputy Director of the Beyond Center for Fundamental Concepts in Science. She got her PhD in physics from Dartmouth and uh, is a theoretical physicist and astrobiologist working on the origin and nature of ni life. Nice little topics. Um, she has recently released From Matter to Life, Information and Causality from Cambridge Press, which I would recommend as well. Please. All right. Hello, everyone. I thought I would show you a few pictures of the Library of Congress. It's the place you often hear about, but if you ever have a chance to come and visit, please do, and I will come and give you a tour around this uh, wonderful uh, People's Palace. Sorry, this doesn't seem to be, there we go, advancing here. And, um, and it was a remarkable thing to, is it not? There we go. Wonderful thing to arrive at the library and to see all the amazing kinds of things that are there, even books that have bindings like that on them, which is really quite something. We don't make books like that anymore, do we? And then I uh, discovered the email address that they had given me meant that I had discovered Luca. <laughs> Just by complete chance, right? So I, out of all the audiences in the world that would appreciate this email address, it is, it is you guys. So um, yeah, so there's wonderful ways that one could do a deep cultural history um, at the Library of Congress, and I hope there are many more Blumberg chairs to come who will explore these things. I thought it was fun to find the, um, the little uh, uh, drawer there that had the Durer star chart with four exclamation points on it as something that even the, the people in the map division were very happy about, you know? Lots of, of deeper histories we could look at, how uh, astronomy and biology came together, et cetera, et cetera. Um, how some of our more recent depictions of the TRAPPIST-1 system might compare to earlier images uh, of the deluge back in the 19th century. We could bring in interesting art historians to analyze these things. Um, that is not what I do. I read dead people's mail. Um, that's the, the fun thing of reading other people's correspondence and, and reconstructing certain stories. This was from Joshua Letterberg's papers, um, something that he sent to Carl Sagan. And if you can see on the bottom, it says, well, this mission answers at least one big question. Are there other planets like ours in the universe? So you've probably seen other images like this one, a very uh, familiar one for, for some of us. Um, and there will be future historians who will look at this particular moment of these sorts of discoveries that land on the front page of the, the New York Times. Um, and on the same day on my Facebook feed, uh, an artist had created this image. And I'm sure this is also something that will be analyzed by future uh, cultural historians looking um, at our particular moment here. I use archaic technologies sometimes. Um, there's lots of different ways that one has to reconstruct the past, including sometimes even tapping into the card catalog. Uh, Carl Sagan in particular is a wonderful person to research at the library. There's uh, 1,700 boxes of his stuff there. That's two million items, I think. Um, it's really kind of remarkable. And there are uh, 13,000 books that come in uh, every day. Uh, Lucas had just mentioned um, my book here, and so I, I wanted to give you a quick little story about these intersections um, of synthetic biology and of astrobiology. Um, and what I'm calling in my project um, life uh, as it could be. Um, this particular man back in 1905, John Butler Burke, working at the Cavendish Laboratory um, in Cambridge, um, thought that he had found new insights into the origin of life. Um, and this seems to be kind of an early moment where spontaneous generation research was being relabeled into uh, origins of life uh, research here. You can see the description, um, putting radium into sterilized bullion, uh, he produced these lifelike forms. Excuse me. 
um, this was reported across both sides of the Atlantic Ocean uh, kind of remarkably. Here's the setup here. He thought that an, uh, a model for the early Earth would be more intensely radioactive. And so he took some radium, which was all the rage at the time, put it into some beef bullion here, and produced these things that were half radium and half microbe, and so he called them radiobes. Um, they grew and subdivided over the space of a few weeks. They decayed in sunlight. Um, but these were these forms that he thought would be illustrative, a model for the origin of life on the early Earth. And this is with a camera lucida. Uh, and so you see uh, they begin to look less and less um, like things you might find with a photograph, but he called them a photograph and published them in his book. So there are interesting, deeper connections we can look at between the origin of life and, um, uh, and efforts at biological engineering of trying to control and predict the future of what life uh, could be. So that was my previous project, um, and one of the things that kind of symbolizes wonderfully the things that I'm discovering now was a birthday card that was sent by uh, Herman J. Muller, who was also very interested um, in these uh, phenomena of radium and life. Now, if I can get past here, this is the Nature article on it, the public display of it. Here is from Muller's papers where he thought radium would um, be a really interesting mutagen to use, and he began to do X-ray mutagenesis in uh, Drosophila as a result of this. Um, and he was a mentor to Carl Sagan. Um, and they talked about the possibilities of life on other worlds, what it would look like. Muller was very interested in engineering new forms of life um, and of, of other possible life forms that could come to, uh, come to exist. And um, Sagan then in 1955, I believe it was, sent uh, Muller a birthday card, which was an image of Mars from 1955, I think it was, um, that had a red thread across it. And it said, the thread of destiny rises ever higher, or words to that effect. And so it's kind of a wonderful way that we can see um, long-term uh, earlier studies at the origin of life uh, trying to uh, understand how it might have emerged and how we might model that uh, ties in, excuse me, with people who are otherwise very interested in trying to think about how we might engineer new kinds of living systems using uh, ionizing radiation um, and other forms and who might be able to um, give insights into other forms of life that could exist uh, in the universe. So it's taken me through a number of um, other debates on inherency and contingency. Um, Simpson, of course, the non-prevalence of humanoids was a very big piece at the time. Um, and the... Um, the common structure that I see that I think is a very interesting thing to look at more um, between um, the history of efforts to create life in the test tube, to synthesize it from scratch, um, and how that um, was claimed to have been successful at many points over the last century. And at every point, we shifted what we thought the fundamental feature of life was, um, so that we then said it, it didn't actually happen after all. That mode of conducting science in the future perfect, I think, is something that might be um, a useful thought for what astrobiology's uh, future might look like, that we might make lots of progress in understanding the nature of life um, and the context for its emergence without ever actually reaching a moment where we say, aha, we've done it. Or we might reach several moments where we think that we have. So um, the questions that I had in mind that I'd like to quick offer to uh, Sarah here um, have to do with this sort of weird story about radium and life here, um, about thinking about uh, substrates for life um, other than those that we are uh, familiar with and how they might be useful for us. And in light of kind of mid-century comments from uh, N.W. Peary and other people, who said that there's often a tendency to associate life um, with uh, whatever the newly kind of discovered type of phenomenon is that we have, magnetism or chirality, optical activity, proteins, um, et cetera. And so when we, when we look at that, when we look at ideas that um, the genetic code uh, itself comes from cultural ideas of cryptography uh, in the Cold War, when we look at concepts of habitability that come from concepts of abodes much earlier on um, through RAND Corporation reports um, that talk about the habitability of planets per man, um, there's a way that scientific understandings of life in every decade and every um, period uh, basically um, uh, reflect the culture that produced them. And so given that that seems to be the case of what the historians see and, and what they think about over time, I'd like to ask Sarah, you know, what does this mean for her claims about going digital with life, given that we have all of the digital things around us? So I will toss over to you with that first question. Thank you. All right. Um, so 
I will probably answer your question through my comments, um, and then I can address it a little bit more specifically. So I, I put what is life progress and problems, but I actually probably should have said that this is really just a disciplinary perspective on the question of what is life. Um, and so we have been seeing that throughout this conference, that different people approach the problem in very different ways. I was trained in cosmology, and so I tend to think about life as a cosmologist would think about life, and that is probably a very non-traditional perspective on thinking about living systems. So I wanted to try to give you sort of the cosmologist's eye view of life, but always remembering that when we're talking about the problem, what is life, it's a very deep conceptual issue. And so I think what really we need to figure out is how are these disciplines actually saying the same thing or where are they saying something different? So I felt kind of compelled to put this slide up. Um, it's, it's a little obligatory at this stage. We actually had a whole discussion in the Laws of Life session yesterday about this uh, seminal book that Erwin Schrodinger wrote. Um, but the thing that really resonates for me about this book is actually his conjecture that other laws of physics were necessary to describe life. And so for me as a physicist, is that actually what motivates me to be interested in thinking about living systems and what excites me about astrobiology. And it's fascinating for me thinking about life, um, how, uh, how this intersects with, with some of the conceptual issues that we really do face in the kind of questions we ask as astrobiologists. So this is one of my favorite quotes about um, our current knowledge of physics, um, which is that the theory of everything is a theory of everything except those things that theorize. And so the reason for bringing this up is, is if we could imagine that we had an understanding of life and we even had a theory of living systems, we had a theory, like a theoretical astrobiology in the same sense that we have a theoretical physics. Would it be actually a theory of things that theorize? And is that an interesting or relevant question to ask? Is that, is that the way we should be framing the question? Our current status of how we think about life in the scientific community is a compendium of, of different perspectives. And so this paper is actually quite remarkable in terms of how it has collected all of the various definitions for life um, in one paper and tried to extract a definition as a compilation of the various definitions. So this is kind of a really interesting insight into the current state of our knowledge in the field. We're at a state where we have so many definitions that you can actually accumulate definitions and make a new definition. Um, and sometimes people ask me why I have an IP address in there. Um, <laughs> That was actually a mistake, but I left it, um, and I'll, I'll kind of allude to that in a minute about which gets to the information aspect it is, is actually, um, you know, maybe that's part of the story of life. Um, so there's a lot of discussion um, about what life is and how we should be thinking about the problem. And so one of the, the conceptual issues in that question that I think is really interesting is what scale are we even talking about? Um, and so usually we'll think about life as a chemical phenomenon. This is the way that we have really been trained to think about it. Um, and in particular in astrobiology, we're often talking about looking for chemical products of life. <coughs> but all of you, uh, a lot of people in this room actually probably flew in for this conference over Phoenix and might have seen a view like this. This is life. Is it as much life as the chemistry happening inside your cells? What about all of these different levels of organization in the biosphere? And so when physicists are thinking about life, in particular from a complex systems perspective, oftentimes they're making the argument nowadays that life is actually the hierarchy of these structures. It's not any one individual level, it's actually the structure as a whole. And I think this is a really interesting kind of shift in the way that we're thinking about the problem. And so these transitions in our thinking are actually really interesting. Is this going to be a new way of thinking about it? Is it a useful way of thinking about it? Does it help solve problems like the problem of the origin of life to think about the origin problem as an actual multi-scale problem, that you don't just need the molecules to come together first, but you actually need things to happen at different scales, populations at the same time as, as individual components? So, um, so Luis uh, alluded to the fact that I'm kind of obsessed with information, and it's probably because we do live in a digital age, so I think I'm totally biased um, by the current um, you know, state of knowledge. But one thing that I think is if, if you take this view of life as a hierarchy, there is 
you have a problem of looking at all of these different scales, looking at things like cities and cells, what could possibly be common about those that you could say they're both life, they're both the same thing at their core? And the one thing that maybe stands out in that regard is that all of these different scales process information and they have information associated with them. So in the origins community, we often have debates about metabolism versus genetics. Um, and genetics is interpreted as um, being sort of the informational role in the cell. But in this sense, information is much more distributed property of networks. So it's kind of a different concept of information than what we traditionally think about in the origins community. And just to give one example, I love this example about thinking about different scales and thinking about what life is. We don't usually think about cities as alive, but you might think of a slime mold as alive. And you'll notice that these two things have very similar patterns. That's not by coincidence. Um, what was done in this experiment with the slime mold is this is the city of Tokyo, and there are particular locations of subway stations in Tokyo. And the engineers in Tokyo had a particular design challenge of building the subway based on the, where those locations could be. And that basically informed um, the design of the entire city. In this experiment, the food sources were basically distributed at the same distribution as the city of Tokyo. And so you get the same kind of informational patterns. And so this is an exercise in um, looking at it from a really radically different perspective. And so the reason I just put up this paper um, that we wrote on this perspective here is just to, to demonstrate that if you have a very dis different disciplinary view, the things you think about being critical to life are very different than the traditional view. And so uh, when we have these conversations about living systems, we need to really think about these things. So I am running out of time. I'm just going to um, talk about, can I, do I have a minute? We're really OK, that's fine. I will, anyway, we have time for discussion. All right, thank you. So yeah. It's terrible when we have so many fascinating things to talk about, but we're going to be a, a little bit brusque today just to make sure that you get a chance to ask people questions if you have them. Uh, our second group, we have John Barros, who most of you know, professor of oceanography and astrobiology at the University of Washington. Uh, with Woody Sullivan, he edited Planets and Life. He got his PhD in marine microbiology from the University of Washington uh, and has been instrumental in the formation of the dynamic astrobiology program uh, that exists there today. Uh, he was co-chair of the Bloomberg Dialogues in Astrobiology and Religion, History and Philosophy, and the Arts, uh, and works on the SETI Institute uh, Science Advisory Board. Uh, I know he's also had many conversations with monks and priests about science uh, that give him a unique perspective. He will be talking with Hester Obermann, who teaches religious studies at the University of Arizona. She works on the intersection between religion, science, and psychology, with a particular interest in how they play out in modern medicine. She got her master's at the Free University in Sacred Texts uh, in Comparative Religion, where she had to learn seven languages, which I find entirely daunting. Um, she also has a PhD from the University of Leiden in Psychology and Philosophy of Religion. She has published on that with a particular interest in consciousness. We are going to be the non-tech part of this uh, discussion and actually have a discussion and I have been asked to start off as the I don't want to call myself the ugly duckling, but <laughs> the odd one out in this group as being a theologian trained in Holland in Europe uh, in a duplex ordo, which uh, theology means there that you're academic and not faith-based, but then all the money comes from faith-based organizations. So I have never figured that out un after, until I came to America, never followed the money. But um, now that I'm here in uh, America, I've been really become interested in the interdisciplinary dialogue uh, between the humanities and sciences, as I'm very much struck that we in the humanities, and I speak of the religious studies and truly the humanities, not social sciences, are monolingual and build walls to keep the nasty, evil empire of science out. <laughs> 
And, um, and that uh, deep kind of knee-jerk reaction that that is the enemy and the other that needs to be either attacked or ignored is, uh, I think, a real problem and a problem that I want to hope to address with John. It's kind of the science phobia. So what I want to talk and ask John about as the scientist uh, here uh, coming from the humanities is astrobiology is inter, uh, interdisciplinary by nature and, of course, uh, attracts a fascination and imagination of all the disciplines. But we talk about it as astrobiology. Isn't there a need for an astrohumanity or even more so of an astrophenomenology? Uh, and I want you to, uh, we'll have more of a dialogue and I can follow up with more information. That's an interesting. Uh, uh, Is it, can you hear us? Okay. Yeah, yeah it's, it's an interesting way to go. We actually had a, a little discussion this afternoon on this and of course, we're very much motivated on, on this because I think of the problem of science illiteracy in this country. And in many cases, that science illiteracy uh, corresponds in some cases to religious beliefs also, given that we are predominantly a, a religious country in, in many, many ways. And so the, the idea is really how do we communicate uh, across uh, the various kinds of religions, how do we communicate with them about how science actually does interact with their belief base and how it interacts with their, I think, their philosophical and theological base. I like to point out in running the Bloomberg uh, dialogues with uh, Derek Malone France, who was a, a professor of, of uh, philosophy of religion at George Washington University, in putting together, I think, the Bloomberg Dialogues on Astrobiology and Religion, one of the, the big questions that I asked uh, uh, related to my personal interest uh, is a better understanding of the core rationale motivation for religion and why or why not is it essential for human existence and whether or not discoveries in astrobiology could impact those core reasons for the origin and sustainability of religious beliefs. Why religion? And so I poised, posed that to this group of people, academics, in a variety of different you know, religious uh, beliefs. And in many ways, they found it, I think, interesting and also confusing as to how to actually really address these issues because I don't think they had really thought through. So I'd like to pose that same set of questions to you as an audience of scientists and how you would actually comport yourself and even, uh, in, in a sense, discuss that kind of topic uh, with them. I would also like to make one other point that I talked to, to you about, and that is exploring and how the, there is a relationship between all of us in science and particularly in astrobiology and how we're exploring uh, the unknown, what we're actually trying to find out as we uh, look for life elsewhere, as we try to better understand our origins, as we better try to understand the origins of our universe, et cetera. And I realize that there's a tremendous parallel between that and how we try to explore that side of us that is not really scientific. We could call it in some ways a spiritual side, we can call it whatever we like, but there is a side that we have. And, but it's still exploring. You don't have to believe in a man God to continue to explore your spiritual side. And so what I'd like to do is, is also have you know, that kind of dialogue. A point that I like to make sometimes is that part of my exploration in astrobiology is looking for that mirror that may tell me more about what I can become. And I'll end with that.
I just want to maybe respond as the first one in uh, to um, exploring and uh, what is the divide between uh, the sciences and re religion in this this part. Of, and I think it's the object subject divide as well. I think in religion and the humanities, we very much look at the the phenomenology of the subjective of the self of the I, whereas the scary part is that uh, the science uh, claims that they are objective, data driven, and of course also uh, have the power paradigm of, uh, of truth on their side. So there is already this kind of uh, imbalance and tension and war kind of uh, situation uh, evolved in this kind of dialogue that I think is incredibly important first to recognize. Uh, are we talking about the subject of the singular, the individual in this lifetime? Are we talking about, uh, Sarah's been mentioning all these other forms of life and that's what you as scientists do, but to make it relevant for the religious, the spiritual or the exploring, you have to find that um, uh, intermediate field and that I think both John and I found that in the exploring, the exploring of the self uh, in this life and of course our imagination of future lives and what of course uh, uh, lives beyond this planet can entail. And I'll make just one more point as some of you probably read in Nature uh, just a couple of months ago there was an article based on a letter that Winston Churchill had written. How many of you read that? And I just think that is really cool because Chir Churchill said it, it's in order for science to be a, a servant and not the master of man, he felt that appropriate policies uh, that drew on hum humanistic values must be, must be in place. And I think that was quite prophetic in, in a lot of ways given the, you know, the time post-war, post-Second World War that that was actually written. I just want to follow up as a, a most interesting question for me personally is different forms of knowing and that scientism, the power of science kind of is silencing other ways of knowing and what you as scientists can accept as other ways of knowing or is that all, you know, uh, pseudo, pseudoscience and untruth and where is there a medium ground that we could maybe negotiate that we could converse on? Our last two panelists are David Grinspoon, who is a senior scientist at the Planetary Science Institute. He was the first Bloomberg Chair of Astrobiology, author of Venus Revisited, Lonely Planets, and Earth in Human Hands. Have I missed one? Yes. That's enough. Oh, okay. <laughs> I, I am constantly amazed um, at how engaged David manages to be and how engaging. He has a PhD in astronomy from the University of Arizona truly interdisciplinary in his research with a focus on comparative planetology, uh, active in Venus and Titan research. Uh, and I think that he is one of the more successful among us in bringing astrobiology to a broader audience. He will be talking with Kelly Smith, who is an associate professor of philosophy and biology at Clemson University. Kelly got his PhD in philosophy from Duke. He has a focus on ethics and biotechnologies, uh, as well as philosophy related to astrobiology and origins of life research. He hosted the first conference on social and conceptual issues in astrobiology last year, which we are hoping to follow up on uh, next year in Reno, Nevada. So come talk to one of us if you are interested in getting involved in that. Okay, so I, I think I'm going to start us off here, uh, and let me just say, if you like talking about this stuff, uh, we are starting a new organization, send me an email, we do really good conferences, Reno, March, it should be very nice. Um, so David and I talked a little bit, and we thought that what we would do is sort of focus on the question, questions about how to make decisions when there are complex kinds of trade trade-offs involved. Uh, the kinds of weird trade-offs you get in astrobiology. So uh, at the risk of sounding a little bit like a setup for an Abbott and Costello routine, I'm going to ask him a question, then we're going to riff off of that, and then he's going to ask me a question. So, David, <laughs> how, how do we decide how careful we should be about planetary protection policies? That's a great question, Kelly. Yeah. <laughs> and by the way, it's very nice to meet you, yeah. and uh, it's lovely to be here. Um, and thank you all for being here. Thanks for inviting us. Um, when we consider 
a question like planetary protection uh, and how much we should worry about it, how much we should invest in it. Um, it's really fascinating to me because it, it really does require and involve a melding of, of ethics and, and science. And, you know, normally when we evaluate risk uh, and we try to uh, be rational about how much we're going to worry about a risk and invest in it, uh, we can consider uh, both the probability of something bad happening and the consequences of something bad happening. And we can be reasonably quantitative about both. Say we're worrying about how much to invest in tornado shelters. We can like, we know something about how often tornadoes happen. We know something about how much damage is done by them. And we can uh, say, here's our estimate of how much it's worth to invest in this. But then when we're really dealing with the unknown, uh, it's much harder to do that. And in particular, when we think about planetary protection, we're often dealing with risks that seem incredibly tiny, almost so tiny that sometimes you can convince yourself that it's sort of ridiculous to worry about them, but where they are attached to consequences which are completely catastrophic, sometimes existentially catastrophic. And that's what's tricky, yeah. you know, uh, multiplying a ridiculously, seemingly low risk by a ridiculously, seemingly high consequence. So it's, uh, we have to somehow find a way to balance that. Now with planetary protection, of course, we have back contamination bringing uh, dangerous stuff here and forward contamination bringing dangerous stuff from Earth elsewhere. With back contamination, my gut feeling is that there's really nothing to worry about. Um, and it's not just a gut feeling, it's kind of an educated gut feeling based on uh, knowing something about uh, biology and the fact that um, pathogens are very well adapted and co-evolved with hosts. So do I think alien bugs, bugs from Mars are going to come back here and infect us if we just bring back some rocks and don't worry about it and expect them in our labs? No, I'm not really that worried about that. But, well, for two reasons. One, I don't really think there's life on Mars, and I don't think Martian life could hurt us. And I, have, I could expound on either of those, but I won't right now. But here's the important point. I could very easily be wrong about that. And so I don't want this policy to be based on my educated gut feelings. In fact, I think it's really smart that we assume we're wrong about something like that when the consequence is, oh, if we're wrong, whoops, we wiped out life on Earth. So, um, <laughs> therefore, there's a good reason to be much more conservative than our, uh, I, our, our scientific understanding might lead us to be. With foreign contamination, of course, uh, there's, there's a, a history there, and, I, and, and I'm quite proud of the fact that uh, space exploration has always been tied to an ethical consideration of this. Of course, at first it was kind of instrument, instrumental in that it was, well, we don't really want to screw up the scientific experiment of finding out if there's life there by accidentally bringing life and then, then finding it. But I think over time that evolved into a bit more of a um, sense of responsibility about the intrinsic value of life and what if there are Martians, what if we hurt them? Again, it seems very low probability to me, but I'm proud of the fact that we take it seriously. I, uh, it's kind of like, uh, the, you know, in medicine they say first do no harm. I feel like that's a good premise for us as we explore the universe. So I'm, I love planetary protections for two reasons. One, there's a, an ethical arm of NASA. It's applied ethics. We're forced to take these ideas that we might debate conceptually and say, let's turn that into a policy. Let's assign it a number even though we don't really know what number it should be. And then let's keep revising that. And the other thing I love about it is that um, there's a built-in humility. It's not just about what we think we know. Uh, what if in the future we realize we were completely wrong with our current understanding of biology? We need to guard against that possibility too. So um, th these are some of my thoughts about your question. What do okay. you think? Well, yeah, I, I'll just add a few thoughts to that. I think. Um, Someone, I think it was uh, Margaret Race, made a comment earlier on about how when you ask these kinds of questions, it's always important to include some sort of time index, right? So the standard view in planetary protection is that our main goal is to preserve the science. And I think that makes perfect sense when you're talking about the near term, because we don't even really know what's up there, much less what might hurt it. And so first you have to get a standard baseline about that kind of stuff. But I've also heard one of the earlier presenters in the planetary protection session, I think, worrying that it seemed like there were going to be more 
people coming on board and like screwing up this, these standards about preserving the science. And my reaction to that is, well, that, that's actually a good thing. I mean, as a scientist, you might not like it, but there are lots of people who have fingers in these pies who have a stake in what happens. And ultimately, scientists are good at certain kinds of things, but they're not good at everything that's relevant to making a social decision. And so it may be painful, but sometimes you have to open it up to people who aren't who aren't scientists. And I would say, just to give my philosopher colleagues a hard time too, sometimes philosophers have to actually be a little bit practical. You, know, you, you can't just say that you should never ever do anything that's less than ideal because that, that can't be done. Well, let me ask you a related question. Uh, I think it's related. Um, and it's uh, not strictly about what we normally call planetary protection, but recently there's a debate about uh, what people are calling METI for messaging to extraterrestrial intelligence or active SETI. The notion that instead of just listening, we should prime the pump by sent blasting some messages out to nearby habitable planets and see if, uh, see if we provoke a response. And some other scientists have said, uh, and, and not just scientists, but people involved in, in this discussion have said, hold on there, whoa Nelly. <laughs> um, are you sure there's nothing dangerous about this? Um, and maybe we shouldn't uh, do that until we at least have a discussion about uh, the possible dangers. And it strikes me there's a parallel in the aspect I was just talking about of planetary protection where we're dealing with something that seems like an absurdly low risk, but admittedly you might not be able to say it's zero risk, and admittedly uh, there's an existential aspect to the risk. So. Um, how much should we worry about that? Uh, well, here I'm sort of torn. So, so personally, I'm just as much of a geek as anybody else in the room. I would love to push the button and send a message and then wait to get a reply. But the more I've thought about this, the, the more cautious I am. I think um, our best estimate is that the probability of there being a problem if we send a message to an, an alien civilization is low. But the error bars on that are absolutely enormous, right? I mean, we we don't really have any good conception of what the technology an alien would have 5,000 years down the road, much less a million years down the road. I'm reminded of Asimov's quote about any technology sufficiently advanced would be indistinguishable from magic. Well, if there are magic aliens out there, I have no idea what they can and can't do. And I know even less about their psychology, their intents, their social structures. So when someone says, well, surely they'd be peaceful, Part of me thinks, well, that's, you know, if I have to make a bet, that's a good place to place the bet. But I'm not going to bet my life savings on that. I'm not going to bet my children's lives. So it seems that however you want to try to quantify the risk, there is some risk there. And I would also point out to scientists, and I, the plenary speaker on the very first day said something about this, what you consider to be an acceptable risk is not the product of a deterministic calculation. That's a psychological sort of thing. And different people have different levels of risk. So even if a scientist thinks that the risk is low and you're being a moron to oppose sending the message, as I used to tell PIs when I was on the Human Subjects Committee, people have a right to be stupid. Even if you're right that they're stupid, it's not your job to tell them not to do these kinds of things. So I think that's, we have to really keep that in mind. Um, and I would say also that, that um, there's, there's something I like to call the principle of perceived inevitability. Uh, just because something seems like it's inevitably going to happen doesn't mean that, that voicing ethical objections to it is a waste of time. So you know, a lot of people say, well, anybody with a laser can do this. Um, I would say, well, having a conversation about it, well, maybe it's not inevitable that we could do things to prevent this or mitigate it, right? Um, and even if it is inevitable, having a conversation about why it's not a good idea might teach us some interesting lessons about other situations in the future. So I think we should be talking about this more. And, and there, there are other approaches to this other than yes, we should do it, no, we shouldn't do it. Uh, there's something to be said for um, saying, well, let's, let's pause a little bit and try to have some kind of a global discussion about this. Not that we'll ever have a perfect global discussion and a, a perfect democratic process where everybody on earth gets a clicker and gets a vote. You know, that's not realistic. But that, uh, just because you can't have a perfect global discussion doesn't mean we shouldn't try to have a broad right. global discussion. And it is true that over the next, um, say, 20 years, 30 years, we're going to learn a lot more about what kind of a universe we're dealing with. We're, yep. We've got the exoplanet revolution here. We're going to be uh, starting to look for uh, biosignatures. We're going to learn something more. 
w um, than we know now about um, some of these probabilities, and we're going we c we're going to be continuing uh, passive SETI, and that also uh, perhaps gives us some time to, uh, to try to uh, think about how you would actually sort of get global buy-in, not just on should we or shouldn't we, but what would we say about ourselves? I'm not sure it's a, um, you know, there's a different e ethical um, proposition that, that it's okay for an individual to just go off and say, I represent Earth, uh, um, than it is for uh, some attempt at a global buy-in of this. Um, so that's, I think that's also worth considering, that uh, not that there be a sort of permanent moratorium, um, but that there be a pause and some attempt at broader consultation. Yeah, I, I'll just quickly say I agree with everything you just said. I, I would add what a lot of people have noted, though, that it's not the formal content that's the only thing you have to worry about. There's the fact that any message will convey your rough location and that you are really, really primitive technologically. So the geek in me feels it necessary to point out that was Arthur C. Clarke who said <laughs> that sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. Um, I think that our speakers have done a really good job, perhaps unintentionally, uh, at demonstrating for us the variety of ways that you can talk about things and perhaps the variety of, of issues that might be important. One of the things that interests me about astrobiology is in bringing people together from different fields. Uh, we discover that, lo and behold, uh, you know, even though you're a physicist, pH might be the most important question. <laughs> Um, and so finding those people who can help you decide what the most important question is, uh, is one of the great, uh, wonderful, and terrifying things. Uh, with that in mind, I will invite people to have questions the bulk of our time. Uh, feel free to ask of a specific person or the panel in general. Colin Coldblatt, University of Victoria. I'll start with directing a question, I think, to Sarah first, but other people, no doubt, will want to chip in. Is, from your hierarchies of life, yeah. is Earth a living entity? I love this question. Um, I would say yes. But my view on what living life is is very broad. Um, and I would include things like technology, obviously, but, but yes, like Earth is alive. And part of the reason Earth is alive is because it's been reconstructed by living things. So my definition or my way of thinking about life includes both what we would call traditionally things that are alive, but also their artifacts or the things that they, they build and the things that they create. Um, so actually, David, you have a really nice example that I love, which is this idea of our planet anti-accreting. I mean, how many planets do that, um, launch things into space? Right? So there's something very interesting happening on the surface of our planet, and, and it is doing something very radical. And um, my, my getting back to answering Luis's question earlier, which I, I kind of didn't, but, but this view of information, I mean, I think we're swimming in a sea of information and, and modern technology, and, and so that's why I like your satellite example, because it's really the information that's launching the satellites into space. So yeah. Anyone else want to weigh in on that one? I would say yes, the Earth is alive. Yeah, me too. <laughs> if I can follow up then, if does life prolong the time for which Earth is alive, or is it just chance that we're here and alive? Are, are you asking about the probability of the origin of life or the probability of the longevity of life? Once, life has, once the origin has happened, does that promote longevity, or is longevity a coincidence? I think it promotes longevity. I'd be interested in what other people think, and maybe even from a theological perspective would be interesting. Um, in my view, the stability of the biosphere is uh, partly a result of the uh, fact that the biosphere is uh, so permeated with life mm -hmm. that the living and non-living parts of Earth are, are kind of hard to um, tease apart from one another. Um, but, uh, you know, it's... Th that makes a lot of sense to me, but as far as people really breaking it down mechanistically and identifying the uh, stabilizing feedbacks versus the you know uh, the destabilizing feedbacks, I think I think we've still got a lot of uh, work to do to understand how that works. Mm -hmm. Hester, do you want to comment? Um, 
Well, uh, if Earth is alive, it is created, uh, and in a religious way and in the most uh, uh, Abrahamic ways, it is alive and it's sacred. So the value judgment is right there, and uh, when it will end is, of course, finit, uh, finitude. Uh, the last judgment, and we don't know when that will be, and that's also in all Abrahamic uh, religions. So it will have an end, and it is sacred to complicate things. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, uh, I'm Angela. Thank you so much for the panel. Uh, this question is for any of the panelists. I wonder if you've ever encountered anyone who will go to uh, all odds or all efforts to make contact with aliens, uh, despite the ex existential consequences that that may bring, and whether you think there's any validity in that line of reasoning. Well, I, I, I've never met anybody who, I mean, it's always easy to have a conversation in, in the abstract when you're not standing in front of the button, but I had a conversation just last night with someone who said, yep, I pressed the button, <laughs> and then we immediately got into it. So there are people who at least say that. Yeah, I actually have met someone. Um, a, a friend of mine named uh, Sasha Zaitsev, Alexander Zaitsev, he's a, a Russian uh, radio astronomer, he's retired now. He's a pensioner living in Moscow, but he um, initiated some of the first uh, attempts at Medi. He used a uh, radio telescope in the in the Ukraine, and he blasted some messages to some nearby stars. It was very controversial. Some people are are really mad at him for that. Um, and I I sort of feel like I could see both sides of this issue. He will tell you there's an he has an ethical obligation to do it. He says if we're going to listen then we have an ethical ob obligation to broadcast, because otherwise, if everyone's just listening, that's ridiculous. And, um, uh, uh, you know, and he may have a point, but I mean, if there, there's a counter arguments to that, which I don't yeah. want to hog the mic here, but, but the answer is yes, I've met someone, and, and there are people that have tried this, and it's, it's because of that that this discussion has been newly provoked, because it's getting more and more possible for people to uh, sort of on their own just decide, oh, I'm going to go and do this. So I, I just want to uh, add a theological uh, idea that we've always been messaging, we've been praying, we've been trying to communicate with the dead, with the, with the living, with the future lives, and we have many gods, uh, ideas in some religions, or just one god, but that messaging is part of our human psyche, uh, and that this is just one step further uh, of a more uh, nuanced um, alien god. <laughs> And that, that question of how we relate our concepts of value uh, to aliens is a big one. Uh, since so many people have read Clark, I will recommend uh, Shikshin Liu has a recent book called The Three-Body Problem uh, that deals specifically with this. Please. Uh, my, Jacob Huck, Mr. Blue Marble Space. Uh, that ties in very nicely with my question. Uh, I'd like to bring up this issue of, of risk with uh, planetary protection, Medi, but I'm, I'm also glad you mentioned prayer and other types of messaging that people have done. So risk mathematically is defined as the probability of an event occurring times the magnitude of, of the, the consequences. And it's important to remember the magnitude can be positive or negative. And so with planetary protection, uh, we're mostly concerned about the negative consequences. If life comes from Mars, wipes out Earth, ne you know, infinite negative consequences. But the, the positive consequences are, are fairly mundane in, in the grand scheme of things. Astrobiologists learn new things. With METI, the, the co it's very symmetric, uh, whereas you know, aliens could come and wipe us out in, in, in that intense negative scenario. But if you read Carl Sagan, Carl Sagan believed that aliens could also come and usher in just as many positive benefits. And so the idea of messaging, we have to be aware of, of you know, this, this symmetry that, that it, it could be just as dangerous not to message as if we do message. And then it tied into the other uh, types of messaging. At what point, you know, do we say that the, pro the probability of prayer working is zero? I mean, maybe people believe that, but at what point do you decide that a certain type of messaging that we're accomplishing now is totally ineffective? And at what point do you consider this minute risk of something possibly bad happening? I think it's not really clear. I, I think we do need more discussion. I'd love to hear your thoughts. Are you asking someone in particular? Or? Uh, anybody, I guess that mainly the three to my right. Okay. <laughs> Well, I think it's an excellent question. I think, I think you make a really good point that there are existential risks, but there are also potential existential benefits. And one could argue that our civilization is now under existential risk without some game-changing developments and that contact 
however provoked, uh, you know, wh however it arises, could be a, a game-changing uh, event that could, that could help us in profound ways. So uh, point well taken. I guess I would also argue that, that I think that the exercise of pausing and trying to have a global consultation about something in itself there's an existential benefit of that in, in, in sort of modeling what would it be like to try to uh, make a decision about something as a global civilization. Uh, that seems to be a skill that we need to learn, and this is an area where, where we could perhaps practice. I'll just I'll add a little bit to that. I think uh, there's, there are well-known psychological biases against loss. So people are more loss averse than they, than they want to actually get. You'll do much more to avoid losing five bucks than, than to earn five bucks. And then you can have a debate about whether that makes good evolutionary sense, right? On the other side of things, I think that scientists in general, and I, I feel this pull myself, what's being offered is something that they deeply want, the secrets of the universe. Right, so that biases them, I think, to pay more attention to the positive effect. That, well, yeah, we might all die, but <laughs> oh my God, right? <laughs> they would actually open up the, the book of knowledge. So I, 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 to me, it seems like that's kind of a wash. You know, it's a tiny chance that you'll die, tiny chance that everything will be amazing, and a very large chance that nothing will happen. Um, if I can just jump in on that. So I think there's a, another interesting way to think about it of, of risk, not just as future oriented and as implications, but as putting it into the context of how risk gets configured at certain moments in time. The fears of back contamination um, and that earlier discussion, you know, of course, informed science fiction writers like Michael Crichton, the Andromeda strain. What I find interesting is then that fictional writing informed discussions of um, biologists at some of the first biosafety meetings at Asilomar in 1975, where they talked about how we needed to have better laboratory uh, safeguards for the new kind of genetic engineering we were going to do with recombinant DNA in the mid-70s. So kind of unrelated fields that began to talk in shared ways through that shared uh, discourse of, of what risk could be. It also makes me think, um, you know, why is Medi an issue? When does it come up? And what else does it remind us of in that particular time? So again, I'm trying to shift away from the future implications to why do we start to think that way about things at certain moments in time? What else is going on? And the ability to know what another uh, potentially very powerful entity out there in the world is doing um, when they're being very secretive and not sharing information with us um, is a Cold War story through and through, right? And so what does it mean to put um, the context of thinking about ETIs into a Cold War context? And there's a lot that we could get about what the implications, the assumptions are that we're making, how it's natural for us, we say, to think a certain way at a given time because of those contexts. I just want to follow up, uh, Louis, on your idea, um, actually piggybacking on what Sarah said, that natural scientists are positive, future-oriented, and that hum humanists are negative. I think it's flipped here, right? So your prayer and reaching out to the divine or the other out there in space is very positive, right? It's one of your tenets that you have to do or should do maybe even five times a day, whereas you all here are really fearful what uh, scary things could come down from this alien world. So just the psychology is for me very interesting as a psychology of religion person. Hi, I just wanted to sort Could of you raise... tell us who you are? Oh, sorry, Avi Mandel, NASA Goddard. Um, I wanted to sort of go back to this question which someone raised is the idea of chance or randomness in the universe and life and how the, you know, when you're talking with people who are either from a spiritual or religious perspective versus a scientific perspective, this seems to really, in the end, after you, you know, go through several layers, really lie at the base of of your psychology and cultural perspective on how you see the role of chance or randomness. And I guess I, I would love to hear, you know, from this panel, how you see that playing not only physically, scientifically in the universe, but culturally and, and psychologically, how we treat random things that either have occurred in, in science or occur to us daily in that sense. Can I address that? Um, I always feel like there's two sides of me. There's the scientist Sarah, and then there's the other Sarah, which I don't know. I guess that's Sarah Sarah. Um, <laughs> and the Sarah Sarah ultimately thinks the universe is a really creative place. Um, and I feel like randomness must play a role in that. Uh, but physicist Sarah is, you know, indoctrinated into thinking that the laws of physics are deterministic and... Um, you know, there's, there's certain 
you know, there's governing principles and there's a beauty in that too. Um, and so I think one of the things that's really interesting about being a scientist is the dichotomy between sort of your personal worldview sometimes and your scientific worldview. And, and I think you hit on that really with this kind of randomness question. Um, and, and for me, it's, it's really about what are the creative forces and, and how do they actually play out in, in physical reality and is there room for the things that I feel like are important to me personally. One thing that I would say in response to your, your kind of uh, beautifully broad question is that um, as astrobiologists um, who have one biosphere to study and draw um, supposedly universal inferences from, we're very um, at risk of over-interpreting random things. You know, we see the, the story of Earth and, and the fact that life sprung up quickly and we infer something universal about the probability of life elsewhere. And then we see the fact that life stayed microbial for so ridiculously long, and we infer that life elsewhere is probably mostly just microbial. And then, you know, we see how long, that it took half of, roughly half a stellar lifetime for so-called intelligent life to appear on this planet, and, and, and we, come to great quantitative conclusions. All these things might just be throws of the dice that really don't have much meaning, but we sort of can't help over interpreting in the absence of more information that we're, we're seeking. Well, I'll, I'll make a comment too. I think that there's a, a theologian at Harvard who's passed away a number of years ago named Gordon Kaufman. And he wrote a book called In the Beginning Creativity, which is I think germane to your question. The way he looked at it is, is that uh, there's a strong creative component to our universe, and he used specifically uh, evolution and origin of life, and particularly evolution. And he used that as a way of trying to call then his God concept as the creative force in the universe. So I, 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 as I said, I, it's a book that I really have gotten a lot out of, and uh, it's so. And I'll add another couple of cents to that. I think I, I teach a lot of evolution creationism kinds of stuff, and, and one of the things that's really hard to get across to students is uh, they think, well, it's either random or it's designed, and you, you want to say, look, the whole point of evolution is this, this weird middle ground between those two, right? It's not exactly random, though you could describe it that way in a sense, right? Um, and so if, if you say is, is universe is random, I, presumably what that means is it's not planned, mm -hmm. right? that there aren't deterministic factors that push it in a particular direction. There's no purpose. But it doesn't follow from that that there aren't statistical biases, right? And so I, I think David's worries are well taken, but the idea that, that it could be that the universe is set up in such a way, I know that's a loaded term, but it, it is biased towards the creation of certain sorts of complexity so that that is a very predictable outcome. And if you ran the universe a thousand times, 950 of them, you'd get intelligent life, that is, that is not a crazy hypothesis. It's unclear how exactly we're going to confirm it, mm. but it seems like it's a live hypothesis. Yeah. I, I might just add to what, uh, what Kelly said uh, in teaching on evolution and religion a great deal. Uh, there are three common definitions of random. Uh, one of them is that it is without any intention. One of them is that it occurs through a probabilistic process. And one of them is that it occurs through a probabilistic process with an equal probability of all possible outcomes. And that last one is the one that gets you in trouble because no one thinks really anything interesting happens that way. Um, and so they assume when you say random that you're talking about dice. Right. Um, and there's all these processes that are biased probabilistic processes. Mm -hmm. Since we have so many people, do you mind if we move on to the next person? Yeah, I just wanted to just point one thing which I really was trying to get at with this focus on culture and psychology is it's so easy to fall on one of the two sides and to fall and continually fall mm -hmm. and I feel our society and culture continues to bifurcate you either believe there's no purpose and no anything mm -hmm. and you know and you're anti this or you're anti the other and I, I just I, I appreciate you guys uh, playing with that that idea so thanks Hi, Jesse Tarnas, Brown University. So um, we've been listening for intelligent civilizations for a while now. We haven't heard anything. People ask, where is everybody? And one of the reasons that it's so quiet that's been proposed is that 
quickly civilizations develop the means to wipe themselves out, and then they use those means to wipe themselves out. So that first gate all civilizations have to get through is development of nuclear weapons, perhaps, because discovery of fission technology is inevitable. And I see the second gate as being development of AI, development of silicate-based life forms. So my question for all of you is, do you think it's inevitable that any carbon-based life form that emerges in the universe will develop silicate-based life forms that are therefore more durable, which would make it more likely that what we would actually discover in here in the universe would be silicate-based rather than carbon-based, which is more what most people, I'd say, would expect. Well, you're really inviting us to go out on limbs, but I'll, I'll, I'll be the first. All right, so I would say uh, it's highly likely that, that in a lot of cases you're going to get intelligent life, and that intelligent life, if it sticks around and becomes technological, will develop artificial intelligence, right? But I'm, I'm not as willing to be negative about the, the prospects of artificial intelligence. I think there's a lot of weird bogeyman kind of thinking going on there. My personal view would be that artificial intelligence is going to be subject to a lot of the same social constraints that human beings are. If I'm an intelligent, if this laptop is, is suddenly becomes intelligent, it's not going to be able to take over the world. It's going to need to communicate with other laptops and spread the word and form social co bonds. And maybe it's actually going to, you know, set up agreements with other human beings. In other words, I think it's going to act roughly like a human. It's just able to do certain kinds of calculations faster, et cetera, et cetera. I'm not convinced that they would necessarily purge all the carbon-based life forms on their planet. What's much more likely to happen is you, is you just get an increasing blurring of the boundary between the two. So you get humans with all kinds of crap in their heads <laughs> and you know, artificial intelligence that are hooked up to all kinds of biological systems and it, it sort of becomes arbitrary where the line is. I agree very much with what Kelly just said. And, uh, in fact, uh, I love I knew you, man. You're a man of discernment. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I've never met this guy. It's like he's in my head. It's weird. It's Neuralink, but um, but I think it's uh, of course nobody knows. We don't even know if we can really create machine consciousness. That's you know Ray Kurzweil, all that aside. That's based on a very specific idea of how brains work that is untested, um, although it's very popular. Um, that if you just connect enough processors and they're fast enough that voila, you've got a brain. Hey, it might, it might happen. But, um, but regardless, uh, remember when multicellular life happened, a, a lot of evolution happens by uh, uh, symbiosis and endosymbiosis and organisms uh, finding new ways to collaborate and, be, and uh, forming new levels of association. Mm -hmm. uh, when, when multicellular life happened, um, bacteria didn't die out. In fact, we basically are very successful colonies of, of microbes. And I don't see any reason why um, the evolution of um, ultimately machine intelligence might not lead to some new kind of um, hybrid uh, partnership where human beings will still exist and might not even realize that it happened just any more than the microbes inside of us realize that they're not strictly speaking microbes anymore um, but uh, you know there, there are a lot of possibilities here and not all of them involve um, us just sort of being superseded it could be uh, a, a, a new phase of evolution um, that we participate in in some way. Uh, Luis did you want to say something? Um, I think it's just it, what's interesting to me is how obvious things seem to every generation that proposes them and I find that an interesting phenomenon you know that of course there are going to be men on Mars of course their civilization is going to be older because it was an older and decaying civilization those stories from the 1890s from the 1900s from that period of course humanity would destroy itself in nuclear war at the height of our concerns about that um, in the middle part of, of this century and of course how AI is going to be something that's how we think about it today so I think that's the phenomenon that I find interesting here where what seems seems to us to be our most kind of natural intuition of how to think about it is always reflecting something of our time. That doesn't necessarily help us know how to do the science better, but it at least tells us something about how it is that we think. And I think that's useful. I just want to make one comment. Is there a limit to AI? And there are plenty of books written saying there is no limit. And so what would that out of limit AI actually look like? And so we, we can't neglect that. We don't know the limits of AI, and that certainly could surpass our intelligence. Um, oh, go ahead. No, I have only have one. Uh, what comes up to me is that it's, uh, through the history, we've always had apocalyptic thinking. So that is part of, again, the human DNA, I think. We think of these end time scenarios, and I think it's so interesting to think of it now in scientific terms. I think I'm going to yeah. go ahead and 
cut it off. Sorry. Yeah. I, we've been a long time on one question. Okay. So if you real quick point. Um, well, I had two points. I find it interesting that we think of AI as other, which is building on theirs. And then the other point, um, I don't remember at this moment, so we'll just move on. <laughs> we, we can come back. Aliens and AI have both been great screens on which we project various right. psychological Oh, phenomena. I remember the other one. All species evolve and change, so um, there's been arguments about AI might actually be the only thing that makes humans have longevity over time. Yeah. So we, we will go extinct eventually, and our only hope of actually having long-term survival is maybe AI. Yep. So. Thank you. Good evening, Sanjay Sum, Blue Marble Space. Um, so the different theologies on our planet uh, have caused large amounts of conflicts, right? How could astrobiology, like, how could astrobiology contribute to the theological conversations to create perhaps a, a spiritual pale blue dot moment to kind of level the highly emotional theologies? Esther? Um, I, did I hear you right? How uh, astrobiology could solve uh, religious violence? <laughs> How could astrobiology? Yeah, yeah, yes. <laughs> just, just putting it down. Yes. Um, this, I, uh, this is in semester's worth. <laughs> Great question, uh, and very important, I think, especially for the 21st century and what we're doing now in in Syria, wherever uh, religious violence is ba made by humans, and we can change the narrative. We can make it aliens in part of gods, and we can make it, you know, other planets. I think that violence is going to be sticking with us as, as long as we're not AI and we're still human. You know, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said that in order to survive, um, we need to find ways to uh, transcend our differences and develop a world perspective. And I think that um, astrobiology actually um, leads us toward a world perspective. I'll, 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 just make, I'll make a comment. In, <laughs> in, in the Bloomberg Dialogues on, on religion and astrobiology, we had people from representing several different religions uh, they were certainly academics, and all of them actually had, were very receptive to bringing some of the concepts of astrobiology into their theology. So the theology is not the weakness in this. It is really the, uh, some of the beliefs that come from uh, uh, the dogma. That's not necessarily the theology. Uh, I mean, even a Buddhist who believes in a flat earth can actually understand astrobiology a lot better than I thought, for example. I'll just, I'll say one thing, and this is not something I would have said 25 years ago when I was an atheist full of piss and vinegar, but you get older and you think about things more. I'm not really sure that it's right to place the blame at religion's feet, right? Religion is a human activity. <laughs> humans are probably the issue, I think, not so much religions. So, so humans can do religion in a way that's beautiful and wonderful, and they can do religion in a horrible way. And when they do religion in a horrible way, it's easy to blame the religion. But sometimes I ask my, my young students when they come in fuming about religion, I say, well, are you absolutely sure that if you could push a button and eliminate all religious belief that the world would be better off? Because I'd be really scared to do the experiment. You know, it reminds me of that South Park episode where Cartman uh, <laughs> goes to sleep for, or he's buried yeah. under the, the ice for like 3,000 years and he wakes up way in the future and there's this massive world war going on between the United Atheist Alliance and the, whatever, the Atheist Axis. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> uh, on that note, um, I, I would just add, there's this interesting question about whether uh, some extent astrobiological knowledge results in ethical knowledge. Um, because a lot of people make this move, uh, and I think it's worth asking how we wish to make that move. Um, and let's move on to Michael. Thank you. Hi. Hi, I'm Michael Hecht. I'm from Princeton University. Um, so I, I'm a lab scientist. I do synthetic biology and molecular evolution. And um, I'm going to try and f I'm going to follow up on the question from our colleague in the back, whose name I forgot, who asked about randomness. And I want to sort of reshape it a little bit. So. Um, a couple of years ago, I was asked to give it, we heard about the Center for Theological Inquiry, and I, I gave a talk there um, a couple of years ago, and, and you were in, Lucas was in the audience, and in talking about synthetic biology and, and molecular evolution, I would use sentences like, evolution selects for, or Darwin's approaches lead towards. 
And I think it was you who asked the question about that along the lines of, is that indicating there's agency in evolution, right? That was your question. And um, I remember this was probably the most important question I've been asked at any seminar, whether, you know, much more provocative to me than any questions I was asked by, I was a chemist or biochemist or molecular biologist, right? So the question was, you know, in talking about evolution selecting for or leading towards, was I implying agency? And it really sort of knocked my feet out from under me. And so I want to talk about agency as compared to randomness. I think the issue is not, we talked earlier about randomness, but I don't think the issue is randomness. I think, is there agency in the universe? And I know what, what shocked me about your question at the time was that even I, in my discussion of, of evolution, which is inherently something that we sort of learn as a process that doesn't have agency, right? Even I, who work in that field, was in my language falling back on a language that implied there is agency in the world. And so I, I wonder to what extent we as humans, as evolved creatures, right, um, have a need in, on some level to see agency in our universe. And I guess I would direct that question to you, Hester, as, to, to the, the religious or theological people. Um, how, how do we look at agency? Is agency in a, as, as seeing a universe that has agency, where there is some agency outside of us, is that a human need? Is that, or is, yeah, I'll just leave it there. <laughs> uh, uh, I feel humbled by this question. It's a huge question, and I know that there are uh, real theologians in the audience as well, in the front row. Uh, I would uh, say that agency is a huge, it's almost like a DNA question, but that religions have answered it differently. If you think of Calvin or predestination, no, right? God has determined everything. There is, you don't have agency, but no, the no, no, world no. I, mean, I, don't, I don't mean human agency. I mean agency in the universe in beyond the universe. us. Yes. So okay. God as, as a form of agency, or, right? Absolutely. So in, in that sense, I would uh, uh, definitely say yes. I think any religion... Uh, and I would have to quickly check off my boxes of religions, will see uh, agency in, the, in their belief form, and that that is a very important connection of a spiritual believer to their religion, right? Is, is that agency? And knowing that there is either there is no God has determined everything or, or uh, the universe, or that through free will or through agency, through, you know, genuflect or whatever actions you ne might need to do, you can evoke, you know, uh, good, good outcomes. Is that answering your question or not? Yeah, but so is the troubling thing about Darwin and why he was so troubling to the world in which he, in which he existed, is the fundamental troubling thing about Darwin is that he undermined our need to see the world as having agency, that there is agency beyond us. I, I Whereas in Darwinian or evolutionary theory, maybe there isn't, and that's unsettling. I, I think uh, the, what, what Darwin was getting at, I think in a lot of ways, and, and, and what we, we do as scientists, is, is we relate determinism with agency. And I, th I think that's what we do. And, I, and you can make that argument that, that, that that's what we're dealing with, and that's certainly what Darwin did. One interesting um, response to that is, uh, I think um, people with different worldviews about um, atheism or religion have a, a different sense of what sort of the null assumption is about that with no evidence. There's that book by uh, the last or the first three minutes by Steven Weinberg and he ends with this um, sort of um, dismal sounding statement about the truth is the universe is completely purposeless and you know I, you know what I'm talking about it's, it's, a, it's a really intense statement about you know just how uh, sorry folks but it's a dismal purposeless universe we, we live in and and so a lot of uh, atheists I know they assume that without definite evidence of some external agency that the null assumption is that of course there is none, but a lot of religious people I know uh, seem to feel the opposite, that it's just common sense, it's obvious that there is, and so without, uh, so the, the null uh, background basic common sense assumption without evidence is that of course there's agency. I, I just wanna echo what Hester said, which is there's, there's two things going on here. One has to do with whether there's human agency and one has to do whether there's non-human agency. And Darwin is decreasing human agency, <laughs> but I'm not sure Darwin is decreasing divine agency in a meaningful way. There's two, two discussions that get conflated there, um, and it's really worth attending to both of them. Linda. I've worked with the SETI endeavor and the human spaceflight endeavor and observed these communities and studied these communities for more than 30 years now. And um, 
And when I talk about the human spaceflight endeavor, I want to focus here specifically on the advocates of colonizing other planets. And I'm, I'm, I'm coming to think of both of these movements really as almost messianic religious movements <laughs> where, where the SETI people so strongly believe that we must do everything we can to make contact because it's possible that these superior aliens will save us from ourselves. And with, with the, the advocates of human colonization of other planets, there's this strong strain of thinking that if humans can get off this planet that we humans have ruined, it will all be different and human culture will be different and it will be better. And I'm wondering if any of you would care well, to comment. Well, on that, I, I'm afraid we are running out of time. Um, that, I think, was a great statement of, of how um, we roll all of these questions of ethics and values and risk uh, into our questions of science and how deeply related they are. Um, I know these folks, if you get them talking, it will be very hard to get them to stop, uh, which is a wonderful thing. Um, so hopefully you will see them later today uh, and can ask them questions uh, with an eye on that clock right down there at your feet. If you have one sentence you would like to end with, Kelly thinks fast on his feet. Let's start with Kelly. Oh, I would say, clearly, this is a great audience. There's some really great questions. So you all need to go to the social meeting in Reno in March, and we can hash this out over beer to your heart's content. Uh, that would be great. In uh, answer to your question, or, or in uh, reference to it, uh, I, I always thought it was interesting how um, these sort of uber uh, atheist nerds, I grew up reading like Arthur C. Clarke and Carl Sagan, who, um, you know, were pretty atheistic, although they might not have used that word to describe themselves. They did uh, believe very much in the possibility of sort of transcendent contact with aliens. And it, Excellent. it Next sentence. strikes me as, as sort of an acceptable <laughs> religious belief for nerds. <laughs> for me, it's fascinating to hear, if you're an atheist or religious, the need to believe, right? And to, to, lead, to believe in a future life. And that's the power of belief. Uh, there is some common ground, I think, between uh, those who believe in religion and those who don't. And I like to quote from the Nobel laureate uh, Jacques Monod, uh, who a molecular biologist who was a known atheist, and he remarked that the most important results of science have been to change the relationship of man to the universe in a way he sees himself uh, in the universe. I guess mine is uh, collective knowledge is always more powerful than what we know as individuals. Um, and that's obviously true from the history of life and the whole point of life being a hierarchy. So we really need to rely on each other to get outside of our you know, indoctrinations and our experiential spheres of the way we think about things, whether it's our discipline or our religion and think about things from other people's perspective to get to the answers of these questions. I think my final thought would be, what is it about our language, our culture, our politics, our society that can help us understand why we think the way we do and what seems so obvious to us as the right way to think about it is reflecting our time and our place here. Thank you to the panel and thank you to the audience. <laughs>